Zenit from Lucid Pixel, and welcome back. Now, I want to have an honest but a fun conversation with you today. And I'm pretty sure if you listen to this through to the end, if you're patient enough to make it through my art talks, because I know they can get pretty lengthy at times, that you're going to relate to one of these different personality types. Now, of course, the human species is one hell of a complex thing. And there are countless different personality types. So, of course, I'm not, this isn't a, a you know, a Myers-Briggs test by any stretch of the imagination. It's just an observation from the perspective of a teacher who's had the honor of teaching hundreds of students over many years. Not only in my mentorship, which I started back in 2015, but prior to that, teaching in colleges and teaching in different teaching institutions. Um, I've had a chance and I've had the honor of sharing the space with so many different creative people. Uh, and it's, honest to goodness, the most rewarding and the most amazing job imaginable. I love every day that I wake up and get to share my creative passion with somebody else. Now in that, in meeting all these different artists, it's safe to say that there are certain artists that learn faster and certain artists that learn slower. But I can say with from from hands-on extensive experience and uh, without any kind of bias whatsoever, that I have encountered zero artists that either succeeded at or struggled with learning based on their intellectual abilities. I think, and, and again, trying desperately not to sound biased, <laughs> although I do tend to love the community that I'm a part of, it takes a certain level of intellect to be creative in the first place. I mean, I mean, if you look at, listen to how scientists describe the future of AI, they'll all describe it in saying, medial everyday tasks, repetitive tasks, are what machines and AI are gonna probably replace moving forward. But the creative process is so incredibly complex that, that AI and machines are nowhere near, if ever, capable of achieving creative accomplishments the way a human being can. So, I hate to break it to you, ladies and gentlemen, but you're already kind of a tear up in terms of brain power. And I'm going to go on the record saying that. With that said, what I do find can interfere with an artist's ability to grow and learn is more often than not a personality trait. It's a way of receiving information and reacting to that information. And in that, I notice that there's certain artists that have a certain habit or a certain resistance that is presented in different ways. And if you're somebody who is striving for growth and might even be you know, maybe you're, you signed up for mentorship or a school and you're finding that you're having a hard time following the material. A, it might be because your teacher sucks. That does exist. But if your teacher doesn't suck, speaking completely honestly, if your teacher does know what they're doing and they have a lot of experience and they're kind about it, they're not douchebags when they teach, then maybe, just maybe, there might you might possess a personality trait that might be interfering with your growth. So I recommend you stick it out to the end to find out and find out where you feel you might fall into this. So I've got a little list in front of me. And the first one I would say, the first type of personality trait that I find I encounter when I'm teaching are, are, are artists that I call, I know, I know artists. <laughs> and what I mean by that is an artist who will give off signals to me, letting me know that the information, or at least making me think that the information that I'm sharing with them is nothing new. Like they've heard it before, this is old news, and you know, can we move this? It kind of gives you, from a teacher's perspective, it kind of gives off a bit of a, can we move this along a little bit type of scenario. Now, in some cases, when we're first starting to get to know each other and it's one of our first classes and I haven't seen enough examples of what they can do, then yeah, maybe I am sharing them, sharing information with them that isn't new and it's a little bit, maybe it's not advanced enough for what they're looking for. And 
that quickly gets resolved when I see their work and we start to talk about art and their accomplishments and their experience. And I go, okay, okay, I can, I can, I can, I can rev it up a little bit because I can see that these are principles that the artist is very comfortable with already. But then there's other artists who respond with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know. Yeah, uh uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I know. That kind of a thing. So I go, okay, okay, maybe I'm not challenging them enough intellectually. And then I look at their artwork and I go, "Uh aha, well, they don't look that advanced yet. They don't look like they've reached a point where they've completely mastered that fundamental. They haven't mastered that principle yet. And I start to notice that that I know I know or that uh uh-huh, uh-huh might either A, just be a communication style. Some people just go, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. And they nod a lot because that's just the way they respond. It's their way of letting me know that they're paying attention. But in other cases, maybe not. Maybe they are trying to give off the impression that, yeah, no, no, I know that's 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 already, I've, you know, I, I took five mentorships already. Everybody keeps telling me the same thing all the time. And that's where I want to stop the artist. If you find yourself in that position where you're looking for new information and you feel that teachers keep kind of rekindling that flame, they keep bringing that information back, it might be because although you intellectually are aware of that fact, although you have learned that lesson, you've taken that course, you've you've heard those principles, you haven't applied them. Or at least you haven't applied them well enough yet. You haven't given yourself enough practice. And if you find yourself in that category where you find that people say, okay, well, you still need work in this. You still need to work it. If you find that a teacher is bringing something up and they they are aware of what you do, they've seen your body of work and you feel like you already know it well enough, I would challenge you, or at least I'd encourage you, I wouldn't challenge you, I'm not challenging anybody here. We're all on the same page, of course. But I would encourage you to ask them why they're bringing it up. If somebody says, okay, well, you know, you got to focus on perspective here and there or the values and blah, 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 and you go, Okay, yeah, I thought I was already I thought it was already there. Why are you bringing that? Like, why do you feel that that's an important facet? Because I'm I, I I feel, and a good word to use is I feel. It makes it impersonal, right? My daughter taught me that one. Whenever you're trying to say something that might potentially hurt somebody's ego or something like that, you say, "Well, I feel like my my values are already okay, but are you seeing are you seeing a weakness in my values?" And if they don't see a weakness in your values. What you've done is you've brought that subject to the forefront. And you said, and you make it an issue, like, is this something you feel I need to address? And if the teacher feels that your values are fine, just as a single example, we could talk about anything, of course, then then they may go, oh, no, 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 I think your values are great. I'm just bringing it up because it's part of what I'm going to get to. But no, that facet of your art is perfectly fine. You don't need to really worry about that. You're pretty solid there. Then cool. You've got the answer you're looking for, and you've given the teacher a little bit of a nod to let you know that, okay, I'm on this already. You know, you you can push me a little bit harder at this point. That won't hurt a teacher's feelings at all. Or they'll say, okay, well, I, I can see that you understand that principle. What I recommend you do is practice it a little bit more. Apply it more actively. Okay? So, um... That basic, that's another way of saying basically is that you you still need some work and if you're stuck on it, if you feel like you are already at a good point but your teacher or a professional is still saying you need work, then that teacher should be able to, if, they, if they're good teachers, right, they should be able to give you actionable advice on how to improve it. And what I mean by actionable is they don't say you just need to practice more. In my opinion, practice, just throw, spewing out the word practice is kind of the lazy, the lazy teacher's way of saying, I don't know how, but I can see it's not good enough yet. That, that shows a lack of skill from the teacher's perspective. Just practice more. Just practice more. You, you, there's no harm and there's no foul in asking the teacher, okay, what about it should I practice? I, just give me something a little bit more specific. Again, be friendly about it. You don't want to sound like a know-it-all and you don't want to sound condescending. The same way you don't want a teacher to sound condescending to you. But just say, okay, when you're looking at my work, what is it about my values that are making you feel like 
it still needs a little work. And they'll say, okay, well, maybe there's just too much contrast in the foreground and background and they're kind of competing with each other a little bit too much. Oh, okay, good. I get that. I, these are actionable things I can apply to my work. And when you can get actionable advice, you can, you can achieve a solution. You can approach that solution very quickly, right away. If you feel like there's this indefinite length of time that you're going to have to practice things without any kind of light at the end of the tunnel, that can be both very misleading and very discouraging. It's like, okay, you've just slapped some indefinite timeline on my growth. I want to be able to get an idea on when and how I'm going to achieve what I want to achieve. Okay. Now that said, if the artist has, if the teacher has given you the advice, if you have that actionable advice and then you say, okay, but what then, what, what happens when I apply it? What if it's still not good enough? And then the teacher says, well, do it more. <laughs> practice more until it becomes more fluid to you. That's when the word practice starts to become a little bit more relevant because I gave you the advice. This is, I'm giving you the steps. One, two, three, do that, that, and that. Now apply it. Okay. And that brings us into our second category of artist. So second category of learner of art, where you might not be getting the growth that you're hoping for. And that is what I call the consumer artist. And I don't mean consumer in the sense of buying gear for art. I mean consumer in the, I spend lots of money and I've amassed this huge, impressive collection of learning material, but I don't use it all that much. And a kind of a good analogy for what I'm talking about is it was a, a Q and A with Anthony Jones. And he said something incredibly honest that a lot of teachers might not have the courage to say out loud. And I, I, I had to smile when he said this. Somebody had asked them the question, what is the common quality? What is a common quality of, of artists, of students of yours? Because he teaches, he has his own mentorship at Ro Robot Pencil. Um, what's a common quality of artists that do well in your course? And it was the most honest answer. He said, artists that do well in my course actually do what I ask them to do. <laughs> they actually apply the advice because there's a lot of artists that just they'll, you'll go out and they'll spend $600 on Gumroads and then you'll sign up for CGMA and then you'll take Tyler Edlin's class and you'll sign up for Robot Pencil and you might take my mentorship and you just binge on learning material at like a collection of art books but you don't actually physically apply the principles you don't practice it you don't sit down and do it physically with your hand okay and that takes me to a second analogy from another fantastic YouTuber, uh, Chris Oatley, uh, who, um, who used the analogy who I probably would have probably quoted on my channel in the past. If you subscribe to a fitness magazine and read an entire fitness magazine every single week for an entire year, but you don't go to the gym, will you be in better shape at the end of the year? And of course, you have to laugh at that question. The answer is, of course not. You can't get in shape physically by reading. You can get in shape mentally. You can prepare yourself mentally. But art is a physical activity. You have to, you have to create a synapse between the brain and the hand, the brain and the mouth. And you do so by applying art physically. And this applies to every different facet of art. When thinking up an idea, Bobby Chu, the artist Bobby Chu is, uh, you probably know, I've, I talk about him a lot on my channel, uh, talks about visualizing. Think, visualize. Cl take a moment, in a, on a, almost in a meditative state, to close your eyes and think about what you want to paint. Don't just grab a pen and start to paint. So you start for a moment and you visualize what you're painting. It's a powerful, it's a powerful step. It's a very important step in successful art because it gives you a chance to flesh out an idea in your head before you put it down on a piece of paper. And then once you've got that idea in your head, draw it out. Don't keep thinking, draw it. If somebody teaches you a principle and value, you go, okay, that's a really good lesson. Thank you. But you don't actually, after that lesson, you don't sit down and do the practice. What you're doing is you're learning in your brain, but you're not learning with your hand. And this isn't only applicable to art. This is a, this applies to everything, every facet of learning. A really good example is when I first started to learn Spanish. I borrowed, uh, uh, you know, an ACS book, on how, you know, a beginner's a beginner's uh, school book for learning Spanish. I borrowed it from my friend, and 
went to cafes every single day and went through all the vocabulary and the grammar and the vocabulary and the grammar and practice words and did the quizzes and did super good and I, I started to amass this huge vocabulary of words and then one day I got together with my friends a couple of my Mexican friends and we went to a bar in Montreal called Momentos it's a it's a it's a Mexican bar and um, I was the only Anglophone in the entire place Everybody was, I'd say 99% of the people there were all from, from originally Mexican. And I sat down with all my friends, a table of seven or eight, and we're having some drinks, and, and they started to speak English. And I said, no, 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 no. We're not speaking English at the table. I said, I'm not going to have a table of eight Mexicans adapt to one Anglophone. No, no, no. I'm going to speak Spanish, even if I have to force it out. And you know what happened? I realized it was the first time I ever got to practice speaking physically with my mouth. Everything that I had done was up in my head. And to anybody out there that's ever learned a new language, I'm sure you can empathize with the feeling of when you open your mouth to speak and your throat closes up. It's like somebody's gagging you. The words won't come out. I hadn't yet made that physical connection between brain and mouth. My brain knew it, my mouth didn't. And exactly that same thing applies to drawing. Your brain knows it, but your hand does not. And you always have to make a point of physically learning with your hand. That's the most important facet of, of drawing. You're creating something physical on a physical canvas. You have to use your hands to do it. You can't do everything up in your head. And it's that kind of an experience. It's that kind of a tactile experience of learning that truly dictates where you might want to take your career moving forward. There's so many artists out there whose artwork I love looking at, but I hate doing. A perfect example of a couple of artists that I'm just completely at odd what they do are artists like Sparth, who's originally from Montreal at Ubisoft, or uh, um, Scott Robertson. Both of those artists would be arguably very sci-fi, futuristic, and very highly technical artists. They're very technical. There's The process of their artwork is like, it's like listening to math geniuses produce art. I love looking at what they do. Whatever they do to get to what they do, I don't give a crap. I just love the finished result. It's absolutely amazing. But damn it, I hate the way it feels to draw that way because I'm a far more organic artist. I'm, I'm much more, I like to manipulate and sculpt and tear and pull at my art. I'm not the type of person who likes to graph everything out in this perfect formula and then execute it masterfully. I don't think well, my creative mind does not activate in that world, but I never would have realized that unless I actually did Scott Roberts lesson. I, I can do it. I can apply it. It's challenging. It's very challenging. This is very advanced high tier art. It's challenging. I can do it because I've done the practice. I've, I've taught my hands and my brain how to do it, but I don't want to make a career out of it. So I can say objectively that I have given it a fair chance and that I do have a lot of respect and, and I, and there are lots of elements of that type of technical drawing that are absolutely mandatory for being a professional artist that I need you every artist needs to have in their arsenal they have to have a strength in it but it doesn't mean that that entire workflow defines me artistically because there's a certain facet of that 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 hamstrings my creative process I just think and feel differently my mood is different than that so I don't a hundred percent do it but I know what parts of it matter to me and the art that I need to produce in order to produce artwork that is considered professional artwork. Now, the last type of artist I want to talk about today is an artist that actually very often starts off very strong. They're artists that very often hit the ground running and excel much faster than most other artists would. They're, they're what you call artists that are that have explosive growth and are regarded very often, very respected and regarded as artists who are technically extremely strong and they, are, they have a very good workflow, they're organized, they're very ambitious, they're willing to do the work that nobody else is willing to do. Um, and that in and of itself is the quality of very successful artists that have very long and fruitful careers and do extremely well for themselves. But that particular personality type can 
sometimes, not always, but can sometimes have a tragic flaw in their ingredients, in the recipe, that can cause them to just drop out of the race. And this is something that I would only be aware of. And the only th this, something that I would, I would bring caution to if you find yourself being this type of artist. Um, if you possess certain qualities and it requires you to be honest with yourself and that is artists that are motivated purely from competition artists that love to be at the head of the race for the sake of being at the head of the race some artists are ahead of the race just because they're they just they, they understand the value of hard work and they put in the hours and the time that other people aren't willing to do. So of course they'll reap the rewards. But that's not that 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 ambition and that drive to beat the to to be ahead of the race has nothing to do with their competitive spirit as much as it has to do with their incredible sense of ambition and their high standards. That's that's where those two personality types differ. I'm talking about the personality type that is always focused on the competition. They're always looking at at everybody else. Not that looking at everybody else is a bad thing, but that's their sole motivation. They look at it and go, "I'm in art now and I want to be I want to be the top pro in I'm giving myself 5 years to be industry leading and I I, I don't care what it takes to get there." In the haul ass and they learn and they practice and they practice knowing that they want to be better at this than Joe Schmo. And whenever they hit a certain plateau and they hit a certain artist, then their their bar raises and they push higher and higher and higher. And at a certain point, what you start to notice is, is that the closer you get, the, the closer you get to that satisfaction of being the best, the less that jump ahead, that that competitor becomes competition. And you start to notice that just as that artist, and you might know artists like this, just as that artist is at the top of their game or they're really reaching the top of their game, they start to tap out. They, st they start to slow down all of a sudden. And all of a sudden, you just start to notice everybody run by them. And more often than not, if these are, you know, well-known YouTubers or people that are very public about their art, they're artists that just disappear <laughs> at a certain point. It's like, man, this person was at the top of their game. There were head honchos. They were doing amazingly. They were they were going to all these different conventions. They were doing workshops. They, you know, they were very successful. They were making a lot of money. They were running great businesses. And then they just ghosted the entire community. The reason that might be is because the whole motivation for them to do it in the first place was to reach that point. And once they reach the point, their whole reason, their whole motivation for being successful in the first place died off. If you are, and you have to be honest with yourself about this, if you feel that you're one of those types that are motivated by, by just being the best, that in and of itself is not necessarily a negative quality. I think that artists are inherently high standard people. We always strive to be our best and we're always, all artists are conscious of everything else that's out there. And being surrounded by talented, more talented, more ambitious artists than ourselves can help to motivate and push ourselves. But you have to have that spark inside you as well because once you get to the top of the ladder, you have to be able to maintain that, that momentum. You have to be able to have a reason to continue creating. If you're somebody who finds themselves in this particular category where you do feel that you are solely motivated by competition and that you are the type of person who gets really good at something and then you quit when you're on top, which if you're that type of person, I'm sure you can very much relate to what it is that I'm sharing with you. And what you need to do is you have to look deep down inside and ask yourself the question, if I took away all of the talent, if I took away all of the, the praise and the adoration of my followers, if I took away all of the fame on my YouTube channel, if I took away all of the success of my business and I was left with nothing but my myself and my artistic expression. What about artistic creation would make it worthwhile for me to keep going? 
If the answer is, well, nothing really, I'm just in it for the competition, well, then there is a risk. Honest, if I speak completely honest with you, there is a risk that you will be that type of person who will do extremely well at something and then quit. You've done it before, you'll do it again. But if you can find a form of self-expression in all of this, if you can personalize what it is that you're doing, find a way to take advantage of this new voice, this great voice that you've developed, that you've nurtured, and you can use it to amplify it and make it bigger than yourself, then you're going to realize that your growth is endless. You will always find a motivation to continue to grow and evolve. And furthermore, you will no longer be building yourself based off of your own limitations, based off of your own standards. You will actually start to grow based off of the standards of everybody else around you. That other people will be contributing to your growth as much as yourself. This very, this very often is why people become teachers. Because they reached a certain point in their career, in their growth, where growth for the sake of growth was no longer satisfying. They needed to be able to, they needed more value to what it is that they produced. So they share their knowledge, they spread their knowledge to other artists, and they continue to feel this feeling of growth through seeing other people accomplish growth as well. I can honestly say that if you're somebody who find, who's extremely good at your career and are, and are um, reaching a certain point where motivate, getting yourself up and finding motivation to do what you do every day is getting harder and harder to do, I would really strongly encourage you to consider teaching because you have a very high standard, you're a very highly technical artist, and other people can very much benefit from your knowledge. You might be a more technical artist, which the world very much needs. You're going to be perhaps less of the artistic type, the more expressive type of artist, uh, of teacher, but you will bring an extreme amount of value, technical value that will never get old. It'll never lose its value. It would be a terrible waste if you're that type of highly technical, highly successful, high achieving, hyper focused, yet competitive artist to drop out of the race the moment that you the, finally you, the, the, the moment you finally catch the bumper of that milk truck you've been chasing after, right? My advice to you at that point would be to tear off that bumper and carry it over to the next person and teach them how to chase after a milk truck too. Teach others how to do what you do because you have a, you have a quality that a lot of people could benefit from. And don't ever let that flame die, okay? With that said, hopefully this advice will help you to find focus if you're lacking it in your own career. And of course, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.